Megan has a wonderful way of always saying far too much, contributing to her rapid career decline and plummeting popularity. Her method is quite the opposite to Catherine Princess of Wales's less is more stoic approach. So today we're going to look at an interview in which Megan's mouth kickstarted her journey to becoming the Queen of Cringe. If you like cringe as much as we do then please subscribe to our channel, let's get to the crunch. When you think of Megan and cringe and interviews, your mind might go straight to the big hitter, the famous or infamous Oprah interview. But there are so many other corkers that have flown under the radar for far too long, starting at the very beginning the engagement interview. This whole thing with hindsight is awfully cringeworthy, but to select a moment in which Megan is clearly being deceitful is the moment the interviewer asks how they met. They begin with telling the interviewer that they were set up by a friend. Here we catch a glimpse of the immediate contradiction she makes about how the British royal family is perceived globally. Watch as her first statement of how she didn't know anything about the royal family due to being American directly counters her second statement of there being a global interest in the royal family. You know, because I'm from the States, you don't grow up with the same understanding of, of the royal family. And mm. so while I now understand very clearly, there's a, a global interest there. Which one is it, Megan? Make up your mind. Do Americans have an understanding of the royal family or not? It certainly looks like she was somewhat informed when she was photographed as a young girl outside Buckingham Palace, or when she was asked by an interviewer which prince she preferred, William or Harry, instead of answering Harry. Prince William or Prince Harry? I don't know. <laughs> Harry? Sure. Maybe she could have stated that she didn't know who they were. If we look at the very first question in the interview and compare it to the Prince and Princess of Wales engagement interview, there is at least one huge difference in their demeanour. Catherine, the Princess of Wales, waits until William finishes speaking before she begins to speak. So it wasn't a massively big surprise, but uh, I took her up somewhere nice in, uh, in Kenya and, uh, and proposed. It's very romantic. Megan cuts Harry off by finishing his sentences, then telling the rest of the story. Earlier this month, here at, at our cottage, um, just a standard, typical it's night a for us. It's a cosy night. It was, what were we doing? Just roasting chicken roasting and having... Roasting chicken. <laughs> trying to roast chicken. <laughs> trying to roast a chicken. And it was just, a, uh, just an amazing surprise. Shortly after, Megan hilariously talks about another time when she cut Harry off during the moment he was proposing to her. Yes, as a matter of fact, I could barely let you finish proposing. I said, like, can I say yes now? She didn't even let me finish. I said, like, can I say yes? I can I say yes? <laughs> Seems like a common theme in their relationship. The engagement interview continues with Meghan talking to Harry in a somewhat condescending manner about guarding the privacy of this elusive friend who, whose identity must be kept secret for absolutely no reason. Uh, mm. Yes, we first met, we were introduced actually by a mutual friend who um, we will... We should protect her privacy. Protect and not her privacy, yeah. Reveal too much of that. Privacy, yeah. Reveal too much of that. And... Um, she then goes on to say that she asked the unknown friend if... He was kind. Watch closely as we see a very strained expression on her face here, as if she were begging the interviewer to believe this nonsense sentence or attempting to believe it herself. I didn't know much about him, and so the only thing that I had asked her when she said she wanted to set us up was, I had one question, I said, well, is he nice? Because if he wasn't kind, it just didn't... It didn't seem like it would make sense. When she says kind, does she actually mean rich and famous? We'll never know for sure. We can only speculate. What is 100% clear is that Meghan's dating and marriage history read like a social climber's dream list. Every man she has ever liaised with has brought her some kind of social upgrade, job opportunity, or more clearly, money. So kind is a nice word, but possibly not the highest thing on her priority list. She probably would have married Harvey Weinstein if that could have brought her some clout. 
Another hilarious little moment in this interview is when Harry admits he had no idea who Meghan Markle was. I'd never, <laughs> never even heard about her until this friend said Meghan Markle. I was like, right, okay, give me, give me a bit of background. What's, <laughs> like, what's going on here? So no, I'd never, I'd, I'd never watched Suits. I'd, I'd never heard of Meghan before. She doesn't seem so happy about this part. She hides it well in the eyes. She manages to keep any anger or ill feeling out of the micro expressions around her eyes, but her mouth tells us a different story. First, we see her jaw slightly protruding, then a slight tension in the upper part of her jaw as if she's clenching her teeth, then a premature mm-hmm, as if to get Harry to finish this topic and fast. All telltale signs that her lack of fame is not something she wants to dwell on. She doesn't want the global attention to be on how not that famous she was pre-Harry. I, for one, had never heard of her nor seen suits, so like many other Brits and Harry, didn't have a clue who she was. The hilarious thing is that as soon as she gets an opportunity to speak, she says the most ridiculous thing as a sort of revenge counter-attack to Harry's comment. Of course, little Harry in his rose-scented glasses doesn't notice a thing. She states that she had no idea who Harry was either. As any loving girlfriend does, she wants to knock his ego down as to level the playing field, so to speak. I think for both of us, though, it was, it was really refreshing because given that I didn't know a lot about him, everything that I've learned about him, I learned through him. But this is ridiculous because the interview is really for who? For Harry. People want to see who Harry is going to marry. It would have been the same procedure if he married Susie from the corner shop down the road. It's not as if people are more interested because he was engaged to marry Markle. Nobody knew who she was. A similar moment in the Wales's interview reveals that the Princess of Wales is not afraid to be vulnerable or painted as the weaker person in the couple, which I believe demonstrates strength of character. When discussing the very challenging topic of William and Catherine's short breakup when they were dating in university, she admits that she found that moment difficult. Let's take a look. University, you've been going out a bit and you split up, famously, all over the papers. What was all that about? I mean, people are bound to want to know. I, I at the time, wasn't very happy about it, but actually it made me a stronger person. You find out things about yourself that maybe you hadn't realised, or I think you can get quite consumed by a relationship when you're younger, and you know, I, I, really, I really valued that time. She manages to be so very endearing, as she awkwardly giggles at herself through saying it. This must have been a horribly challenging moment for her to discuss. As you can imagine, it was most likely a heartbreaking time for her. And we can tell that throughout this interview, she is extremely tense. She is not used to having a camera in her face. But although she is nervous, she speaks in this moment with beautiful humility. The last big difference we see in Meghan and Harry's interview is the presence of love bombing which is a manipulative tactic often used by people with narcissistic personality disorder to gain control in a relationship. Friends, family or romantic partners can love bomb you by showering you with gifts or being overly complimentary or constantly giving you attention. In this case, in this particular case, Megan will cut the interviewer off in certain moments just to repeat something Harry has said whilst gazing lovingly at him or laugh uncontrollably at something not very funny. It's disingenuous at this moment, but also inappropriate in an interview setting. When compared with the Waleses, we see that they are fully focused on the interviewer and his questions. It seems that only in brief moments when their guard is let down, for example, after William cracks a joke, we see Catherine and the Princess of Wales briefly relax, but try not to laugh at William's actually funny jokes, or we see her glancing at him lovingly. It's very clear to any viewer that they are much more genuine emotions. One person said, find yourself someone who looks at you the way that Princess Meghan looks at Prince Harry. So many things are wrong with this comment. First of all, 
she's not a princess. Second of all, if someone looks at you like that, run as fast as you can in the opposite direction, because otherwise you're going to be dealing with a manipulative narcissist for a very long time. Someone else said she literally latched onto him and is not letting him go until he is no longer useful. That's very true. She will drain him for everything he's worth. Of course, it seems like he still has some use left in him because of his inheritance that will be coming to him very soon. The more people that he knows in his family that die, I'm sure the more he will receive. And I'm sure Megan is very aware of that. Someone else said, well, the corgis were fooled, so you can't blame him. So later on in this interview, we'll show the clip now. Harry claims that the corgis fell in love with Meghan immediately. And of course, many of us, me included, believe that you can tell if someone is good or bad, depending on how your dog initially perceives them. That is, of course, true in certain circumstances with certain dogs, but some dogs are not that intelligent. So you cannot, as you really should not, base your judgments on people based on how your dogs initially react to them. It could just be that they smell a bit like cheese. Who knows? Personally, my dogs fall in love with anyone who smells a bit like they've had some bacon for breakfast. And the corgis took cheese straight away. <laughs> That's true. For the last 33 years been barked at. This one walks in absolutely <laughs> Just nothing. laying on just... my feet during. Someone else said, Megan is very aggressive, assertive, masculine overtaking the conversation and speaking over Harry. This is so very accurate. Compared to Kate Middleton, who is more demure, feminine, and soft, Meghan is all smoke and mirrors, very fake, a social climber. But I think Harry and Meghan go well together because she is the masculine energy and poor Harry is the feminine energy who has mummy issues. Meghan is the perfect mother figure who wears the pants in the relationship which Harry loves and needs. He seeks a protector and a mother in his partner. It highlights exactly what has gone wrong. Harry needed a strong mother figure due to his traumatic history and that, unfortunately, is what he's got. Someone who has completely ripped him from his own family, ultimately causing a second tragedy for him and his children. Someone else said at 12 minutes and 42 seconds, Harry says she's capable of anything. How prophetic. There's so many moments in which Harry states, Megan is going to be so good at this job, maybe better than people that exist in it already. And there's so many, even during the Netflix documentary moments when he states Megan was better at the job than other members of the royal family. Their judgment is so clouded by their egos, unfortunately. It takes a lot to be good at a job and that is also noticeable in the follow through. I can imagine how hard it is to be part of the royal family and go out on royal engagements frequently, especially if you're pregnant or you're tired or something's gone wrong in your family and you don't feel like facing the public and people you don't necess necessarily know. But part of the thing that makes the royal family so good at that is their consistency. They're always there. The queen was always there, whether she felt good or bad or not. She was there at the Jubilee when she was terribly ill. She made an appearance. She was extremely weak and frail. They, we, were, we were told that she was indeed rolled there in a wheelchair and she managed to st stand up on the balcony for all of us to see. That dedication, that perseverance is what makes you good at the job. Not <laughs> sticking at it for three minutes and as soon as somebody calls you something mean, fleeing as fast as you can in the other direction. That does not make you good at the job. Give this video a like if you think Megan may not be the very best at the job and subscribe to help our crown family blossom. See you down in the comments.